but since it's him and United Church and later of Church of the Three Crosses, um, he started out there around the same time I did. I don't know, were you in the the Methodist Church? Yeah, he said so. Oh, okay. In 58. Okay, so I came to the United Church in 67. Okay. Um, Frank is a retired lawyer, a, a loyal um, church member, done all kinds of services, and I'm not doing justice to him, but I maybe we'll turn over, or Frank, do you have other things you'd like to mention or that you want me to mention? Well, sorry. We came over with Emory Purcell from the Methodist Church in 1970 then, right? Yeah. Uh, well, why don't I just sort of take it over? Is that yeah. all right? <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. Uh, and if anyone... Thank you. Thank you. I guess it was the... I'm losing something here. Yeah. Oh. Frank said earlier that he got a message that his router was giving him a bad connection. We get that sometimes and... Uh, uh, well, that's, that's okay. I just, uh, if anyone has trouble hearing me, I just, you know, wave your hand in front of the screen and I'll try to make it better, unless you're on mute, in which case you won't be able to do it. Um, I, as I, I, I see many old friends here, and a couple of people who are fairly uh, new to me. Uh, I'm Frank Schneider. Uh, Karen and I uh, moved to Hyde Park in 1965. Our children were born here. Frank Allen was born in 1966. Uh, and Beth was born in the end of 1967. And around 1968, Karen became involved with the Hyde Park United Methodist Church. And in fact, our children were baptized there. And uh, we were around at the time of the merger between the Methodists and the uh, Congregational Presbyterians, uh, which was the old United Church. Uh, my involvement dated from around that time when Emery Purcell, who most of you know well, uh, came to me and said that the Methodists need a temporary treasurer. He explained that the, uh, in the course of the merger, the bills were all being paid under one account, but each church would write a check to the joint account uh, and then the joint account would administer all the funds. And the United, existing United Church treasurer, a man named Bob Smith, uh, was the one handling that. And all I had to do was write a check, uh, I don't remember whether it was once a week or once a month, to the United Treasury and do it for about a year and a half till everything got um, uh, together. And then I could... Uh, that would be the end of it. Of course. <laughs> of course. Well, the first thing I found out was that it wasn't just one check, there were a couple more. Uh, and then the uh, United Church treasurer uh, left town rather suddenly. I had something about a young woman, but I never figured out quite what it was. <laughs> uh, and uh, that was so that the, what? Someone comment something? Judy asked who that was. Oh, oh, you mentioned Bob Smith, right? I, I do remember the. Yeah. Well, anyway, I, uh, I was treasurer and then I, be, I cycled through the various uh, offices of the church, treasurer, uh, on council, finance committee. Uh, uh, at one point I was deacon, which is when I got to know uh, Ted Swain, and Karen and I raised our children, uh, as did the Audrains and Lampkins and several other people. We went to many events. We had the 
the uh, uh, Shrove Tuesday, which was Tuesday, and Cal and Ann, I, I will always remember and, and be envious that we would come up with these wonderful costumes for the, for the occasion, and the Audrains would always beat us. So, <laughs> uh, anyway. We have more kids. <laughs> yeah. Well, you utilize them much better, too. Uh, and and uh, we went a couple of times to the Tower Hill camp for a weekend and several other things. Until uh, 1991, we moved out of the neighborhood we, uh, and terminated our relation with the uh, United Church of Hyde Park. That was during the time of Jim Child. And uh, in 1993, we became members of the Church of the Three Crosses. Uh, a small church on the near north side and near the border between Old Town and Lincoln Park. It was about a block south of Armitage and two blocks west of Clark Street. Uh, it was uh, Methodist and UCC. Uh, and we have met a member of members of that church since that time. Uh, Karen doing her thing, me doing mine. In any event, around 20, the summer of 2004, uh, our pastor, who was Methodist, uh, was reassigned the, in, I think, February on short notice, as in 30 days and she was gone. Uh, and uh, we uh, got a, an interim pastor a man named John Hobbs. There's a long story of getting him to be our pastor, which I can share with any of you sometime. Uh, and uh, John had grown up in Eastern Tennessee. I think he went to a Methodist church as a child, went to a Presbyterian seminary. Uh, he had his church, he was married, had two children. And about 20 years later, he came out. Uh, and back then, it, that was not accepted as it is today. And he said the church didn't defrock him, but they just wouldn't give him a pastorate, including the one that he had been serving at the time, uh, whose members wanted him to stay. In any event, he came to Chicago with his partner. He was a head of a, of a religious homeless uh, uh, group. And... Uh, uh, for about 10 years, I got tired of fighting the Methodists, went to the UCC, uh, and they ordained him, and then we came calling. So he was our interim pastor, and incidentally, uh, contrary to rules, he became our permanent pastor, but that's another story. And in the summer or early fall of 2004, he brought up to the church council the issue of open and affirming. Uh, and the inquiry was from the UCC as to whether we were an open and affirming church. Uh, the council decided to refer it to the congregation. Uh, our bylaws provided that we would follow the dictates of each denomination but when there was uh, a conflict between them, uh, the council would decide which denomination to follow, subject to the uh, wishes of the congregation. But the council decided it was something that should be submitted to our congregation. And so we had a meeting in the fall of 2004 to consider whether we were going to become an open and affirming congregation. I know they use ONA now. That sounds like a secret society to me, but we used open and affirming. Um, and uh, so we, we had the meeting and we decided to explore the issue. It was not a simple um, meet, vote, one and done. It was uh, a matter of, uh, of exploring the whole issue. 
And we decided to, to proceed on that. At one point, we asked for a covenant of those who were present that they would pursue it seriously. So we then had a second meeting at which we invited another church, the Epiphany UCC, which had gone through that same process previously uh, to come and tell us about the procedure and what they did and, and how it went and, and so forth. And so they talked with us, with us about their procedure, about what they did and uh, getting to the point of de deciding as a church to become open and affirming and that it was a good thing for their church that they were able to uh, come together around that and then uh, move forward. Uh, so we continued to have meetings every two or three months. Uh, I think always right after the church service. We had coffee time after service, so we'd go get some coffee and goodies to load up and then go and have our meeting. The first meeting we had 20 people, which is really quite good considering our attendance at church at that time was somewhere between 20 and 30 every week. Uh, so we met the, the third time and we talked about the biblical bases of uh, the prejudices against gay people. And by gay people, I mean gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgendered, queer, questioning, asexual, intersectional, everything else. But I'm using gay as just sort of a shorthand phrase for that. Uh, if there's a question, uh, I'll be happy to take it, but let me continue. Uh, we had a we talked about the biblical basis uh, and what was right and wrong and the various interpretations of the Bible. Uh, we didn't really get done, so we had a second meeting on that. Uh, so that's number four, and we had a fifth meeting then about three months later, uh, at which uh, we talked about whether we wanted to proceed to become an open and affirming congregation. And we felt, uh, those who were at the meeting, that we should let everyone know to give everyone a chance to participate and to let them know where we were both uh, in the open and affirming thing and also in the process of, of uh, learning and deciding. And so after the fifth meeting, uh, our recorder, who was my wife, Karen, summarized all of our previous five meetings into about two or three pages, which were shared with the congregation. And then we had a sixth meeting and we invited a number of people who were gay, lesbian, et cetera, to talk about their experience and what going to an open and affirming church meant to them. It was, it was quite good to, to listen to the positive feelings that people had for a church that was willing to say and to act in an open and affirming manner. So after that, we decided to have a congregation meeting, uh, which happened uh, in January of 2006. Uh, and uh, we had 20 people there. And the resolution to become an open and affirming church passed unanimously. Uh, so uh, that was that. But you know, it's, it's good to talk the talk and walk, but walking the walk. We found after we became open and affirming, uh, basically nothing happened. Right. Nothing was different from what we had before. We still greeted visitors. Uh, we still got together for coffee. We still enjoyed each other's presence. We still 
did the various things that we did before, both in and out of the church. But we did note that there seemed to be uh, an openness present and that uh, we did get some gay people, but we also got straight people. Uh, in fact, I talked yesterday with a woman, uh, the couple had uh, joined our church about five years later after we had gone through the process. And I said, did uh, the fact that we were open and affirming mean anything? Her comment was 100%. We never would have considered joining if, if, you, if you were not an open and affirming congregation. Uh, so we've gone forward. We have been an open and affirming congregation since uh, 2006. Uh, it has not hurt us, I don't believe. Uh, we presently have a pastor who is... Uh, uh, Methodist lesbian who uh, uh, is much more militant than some of the rest of us. And so there's a, a more of an emphasis right now on it. Now, as far as uh, the lessons, what we learn, uh, we learn that becoming open and affirming is a process a process of education, a process of learning, a process of encountering, uh, and a process of doing. Uh, and uh, we learn uh, that uh, gay people have some triggers that we, as I, as a heterosexual old guy, might not fully appreciate. Uh, they, uh, uh, you know, the, the casual jokes, I'd compare it to uh, racism where you got people who are, uh, uh, you have no idea that what about the race thing. And, and, uh, one day they just come up with a remark that's just, oh my God. Well, it's the same thing with gay, with gay people. Uh, you know, uh, uh a comment like Adam and Steve is going to scare them off. Uh, and they are very skittish about it because gay people have been hurt by the church. Uh, and and uh, so safety is something that is important. They want to be in a church that's safe. So it's not enough to say you're open and affirming. You have to be open and affirming. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the comment was uh, made that what gay people look for in a congregation uh, is, I'm making, seeing my notes, the gift of the ordinary that is being treated like anybody else. And uh, if you've got bad people, whether they're straight or gay or white or black or Hispanic or anything else, uh, you know, call out the bad behavior, but recognize that this is something which is lending toward a more inclusive congregation. So that's uh, what I have to say, except I see Sue Davis. Oh, yeah. Goodness. Yay. I know all of you except for you, uh, Mr. Chen, right? Yeah. Chen Wait. Clearing. Yeah. I don't know him. But other than that, I know all of you. <laughs> okay. Well, I know most of you and some of you I've just sort of met in passing, but many of you I've spent many hours with. And we can reminisce about that. But uh, anyway. My church, my church out here in Plainfield, Illinois, just went through this about 10 years ago. And we did probably exactly the same thing you did, which was get the, the church congregation involved and uh, talk about it and uh, take you know, many meetings. And uh, then the council brought it up and vote and it passed with no problem at all. There were a lot of speeches. And uh, I remember one girl saying that if 
if we didn't vote yes on this, she was leaving the church. <laughs> but that has happened. Uh, yeah. Jane, uh, Jane Dell, who was a member of our congregation briefly, went to a church in Northwest Indiana and went through the, the gay and uh, the uh, open and affirming process yeah. and it lost by one vote. Oh. Mm -hmm. So that was pretty much the end of that church. Oh, how sad. <laughs> and, and another person remarked that you really want to have like 70 or eight, you want to be assured that if there's 70 or 80 percent at least. And most people are are in favor of it. It's it's a, a matter of simple right. justice. Yeah. I never never bother anybody in our church. But I I'm sure there are people that are homosexual or lesbian that don't let us know. But yeah, well that that's one of the things that was uh, drummed yeah. into us too. Uh, don't out a gay person without right. their consent. Exactly. And exactly. A similar thing is don't out an anti-gay person without right. yeah. consent. Yeah, yeah. That was about 10 years ago. I think it's, we have so many more issues at this point. <laughs> Everybody does. Oh. Well, my son, Peter, who you would remember yeah. Yeah. Um, since we were, he uh, is, He's now married in Massachusetts, um, and he and his wife belong to an Episcopal church. And I don't know if they consider themselves formally open and affirming, but they certainly are actively opening and affirming because they have uh, a lesbian pastor who actually married Peter and Celeste. Oh, really? <laughs> and... Uh, um, And then there, and a number of uh, parishioners who are gay couples. So, and I've uh, I have been going to their um, services actually by Zoom the, quite oh, a bit. Here. I was going to say, oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been kind of interesting because it gets me, it gives me a little bit of a view into their work into their world yeah so that, that's the good thing of having a a son who lives in boston you get to visit him yeah right yeah yeah well they live outside of boston at this point they're in reading which is one of the northwest little towns that are now the exurbs so Tracy, I, I can't I can't believe how young you still look. <laughs> Thank you. I will accept that. Thank you. No, you're not going to say the same to me. <laughs> I tell I'm just so excited I, to see everybody on here. Yeah, um, I, but what, I actually had a question for um, for Mr. Schneider about what it um, sort of when you say to act like it. So I guess there's one thing to mean to say that you're open and affirming, but then another to act like it. So what does that really look like when you say act like it? And I say that only because I feel like sometimes we are uh, kindness challenged. We're a little, we have a little difficulty, I think, sometimes being friendly. And I think sometimes we think we're being friendly, but we're really not. And I wonder, is there a way that how do we know that we're, how do, how do we really act it out instead of just saying, like, I have no problem with it. But am I doing something that is deterring people or something that I'm not really aware of? Well, I think that uh, the, the whole idea is to uh, treat a gay person just like you treat every, anybody else and not either call attention to it or, uh, or obviously uh, avoid the subject. Uh, they they uh, matter. Uh, of treating gay people like everybody else is important. And also the matter of sensitivity. Uh, you know, you have to kind of screen yourself, make sure that a comment that you might, a joking comment about a gay person might be perceived a little differently than a joking comment. And I think if you do those, it, 
there shouldn't be any problem. Although a friend of mine said one time, he said, uh, they tell me to act naturally and they say, don't do anything stupid. I wish they'd make up their mind. <laughs> uh, but that's, that's my feeling about it. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> well, Wei Jen said uh, earlier, it says my internet connection is unstable, so I don't know if I'm coming through. But earlier he said that he had visited some other Hyde Park churches, including ones that were formally open and affirming, and he didn't find them as friendly as uh, United Church, and that's why he's here. But so I wonder, are there any actual differences except in our uh, maybe outreach and publicity that open and affirming would uh, not make for United Church? Who, who are you? Are you asking me that? I'm asking Wei Chen, chairing, who's, for those of you who don't know him, who's our uh, digital minister. Oh and is uh, guiding our, our ONA process. Oh, or maybe that's a question to ask uh, the uh, Frank's uh, minister who's going to be talking to us in 10 days. Yeah. Now, now the church I mentioned before, that mm -hmm. was uh, UCC and ABC, um, American Baptist churches. And although they kind of all open and firming, mm -hmm. but we cannot see any open and affirming logo, rainbow flag at all uh, on their church websites or inside or outside the church building. Uh -huh. I cannot see anything. And we can see, oh, it seems that according to the document, that church wall is an open and affirming congregation, but I cannot sense anything <laughs> there. Well, our, our church does have a, uh, on the, board outside says open and affirming and reconciling congregation and we do have the rainbow flag on the on the thing you're probably aware that the methodist church uh uh had their uh, i guess international conference a couple of years ago and rejected an effort to open the church up uh, which caused our own pastor uh to go out and we've got a one of the signboards says uh, United Church of Christ United Methodist Church and she put some blue tape over the word United in oh. front of Methodist Church. <laughs> uh, I think she took it down by now but uh, that that anti-decision was very painful to a lot of people. Yeah, one of the reasons that um, I think it's a good time for yeah, United so, Church so of Hyde Park. Yeah, something on our signboard. Be... Yeah, I think it's a good time for us to <laughs> working on open affirming at this time because next year the met at the church, they are, they are ready to just split into two different bodies uh, because of LGBT issues. So I think it's it's a, it's a time for us to prepare for that moment. But uh, at this, there, there would be three phrases then on our, our signboard because the Presbyterians call it light, more light. You mentioned reconciling. Yeah. Of... We're, uh, the Church of the Three Crosses is not affiliated with the Presbyterians. But oh. I, in reading Wei Jen's materials, it looks like uh, the Presbyterian phrase is more like Presbyteria. Uh, oh. But in any case, it, it's important to bring everyone along in the process. And, uh, so, I think and our uh, church has it on the website that we're open to affirming but on the outside sign, I don't think so. Okay. Is there anything on our side? Not yet. 
Or we have a rainbow flag. <laughs> yeah. Does it have a rainbow flag? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's at least a step, right? And then once you're official, then you can put uh, that on there? Yes. So in our case, we will pass three. <laughs> For UCC, PCUSA, and UMC part, we have three different. We need to, to finish that all in once. <laughs> mm -hmm. So well, when you say that, are there different steps for each uh, denomination that we would have to take? Is that what you're saying? Uh, actually, one step, but in the statement, we'll include all of them. Uh, we don't need to go into details, but at the last uh, uh, sort of committee meeting for the ONA, we looked at the old uh, statement we uh, had generated back uh, 20 years ago when we first tried the process, which was uh, uh, only for UCC because there was no thought then of Methodist or Presbyterian. And now the statement is basically three times as denominations have their own wording, which we are incorporating. Whoops. Who was that? Is it Marcia? No. Who just said whoops? Well, I'm kind of new to like our process, I guess. And I just kind of wonder what step are we at? Frank talked about numerous meetings. Are, have, have there been meetings to talk about this and get the congregation involved so far? Or what's the, what, where are we at in the process? Welcome to COVID time. <laughs> yeah. So, shall I? So, we've had the, uh, uh, what do they call it? Uh, the, the words from the Bible that are used to, uh, to condemn homosexuals. We've, we've gone through those. Uh, that was a Zoom meeting for the congregation. We've had uh, the talk visiting, from visiting uh, queer folk telling about their uh, uh, life experiences <laughs> and for a concert <laughs> that's not part of the formal uh, we've uh, not had we haven't had a questionnaire yet have we or have we at the congregation I don't think so. No. That's, questionnaire yeah. meaning sort of just kind of gauging the temperature of the congregation and what their feelings are kind of thing or? Yeah, I think that's intended to be part of the process and it was 20 years ago. Yeah, long time. I was there when they were doing this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You think it would be better to uh, send the questionnaire out after you have done a certain amount of educating, since uh, a, putting it down on paper may cause people to, to freeze their thinking. Uh, I think it's just that we've been stuck in COVID time doing almost everything on Zoom, announced in the weekly newsletter, but people don't read the newsletter. It's I do. Also I do. <laughs> from the pulpit. Mm -hmm. good. Oh, good. I said I do. It's also announced from. <laughs> yeah. Good. Things are said from the pulpit on Sunday, like, okay, so we're going to have this. But it said once, not the what is it, six or seven or 12 times you have to repeat something for it to register with people, they say. Uh, so I, I don't know. The church is meeting in person, but a large fraction of the congregation is sticking with Zoom. Well, except you don't Zoom, you have YouTube. Yeah. Well, right. whatever it is, yeah. you can get it right. on or Zoom, Facebook. you can get it on uh, YouTube, you can get it on Facebook. I don't do Facebook. I wound up go Zooming to Massachusetts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we but, know people who <clears throat> go to lots of different churches on Sunday, thanks to the internet. 
So do we have some kind of a, a timeline? Of we're meeting once a month, every two months. Is there some kind of a, a plan in place as far as, or are people just kind of trying to figure out what's going on? Well, we have the two things, the, the guest uh, pastor from Church of the Three Crosses. A week from Wednesday. And then the concert. The concert is um, the 21st. Right. Two weeks. That's the blue. Wild blue ukulele orchestra. orchestra. And then we have, uh, I don't know, some committee meetings for it in December, but I think there's also intended. Uh, I guess we had a schedule put out, a, a roadmap, but the church council has to approve some of the later points of that. Uh, and they've, they've become, I guess, involved uh, in, well, uh, the things we're doing this month have been approved and it will go forward. But uh, I think maybe we do need to, uh, I don't know, uh, just have a document that we send out by email and distribute it for, uh, during the service. On, black and white on paper for people who read and don't go on, don't uh, go online for the newsletter. I think what Mr. Schneider shared about letting people know what it's, I mean, having, giving them more information, because for me, I kind of thought, well, I think I'm accepting of everybody, but what does that mean for the church? What am I saying I am agreeing to? And I think that might be kind of helpful for some people to know. I mean, so basically you're saying, I don't really have to do anything different, just be friendly and try to kind of be mindful of what my words are if I might have made some sort of comments that might not have been on the up and up previously. That's kind of the gist of what I'm getting. Other than that, I really just need to be friendly, right? I mean, that's and not treat anybody any differently. So I think if, I, if people yeah, know right. that, that might be helpful right. to them like, oh, I can do that, you know, as opposed to, am I supposed to join some sort of group or do I have to do different things or letting people know exactly what's expected of them, I think would help them to vote, to know, okay, what am I voting for? Yeah, but that is because for now a few decades, the church's attitude has been, don't ask, don't tell, who cares? <laughs> that and, doesn't work very good though. Uh, so that, for example, rules like that, that a leader of the church, a member of the council must be a person who is married to one person of the opposite sex, we've ignored. There have been single people on the council and gay people, and we've had gay uh, music ministers and so on. Uh, gay, gay music uh, minister. And, and so the rule firming would have meant one is putting aside. We've never really been following. <laughs> So the only change is to continue to be friendly. Well, one thing involved with that is at the end of the service, if you see a, a visitor, go up there, even though you had some church business that you want to discuss with a member of the council or something. No, because you don't want the visitor to just walk off and not that we've had for the church for decades uh, in, a, in any case. And maybe this will sharpen our uh, our dealing with that and the improvement on that. Uh, um, we like to think we are a welcoming congregation, but particularly when it comes to uh, visitors at, the, uh, at our uh, services, uh, we tend to ignore them. Uh, and uh, we need not to always. Well, we miss Frank Schneider, who always met the visit. Yeah, the visit. The oh, but the but meeting visitors and greeting people is really everyone's job. Uh, you were just you were you're just very you are very good at it, Father, as I remember, Frank. <laughs> I enjoy it. Uh, and I think, you know, Tracy, you had it, you, you summarized the whole thing in just a couple sentences. I, I am impressed. Uh, but the, uh, uh, the whole idea is to, is to be open to visitors, to be affirming of everyone. 
Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, treat them all in a, in a good fashion. I've been, you know, every church is a friendly church, even at churches that are not very friendly. <laughs> but if you can, if everyone can contribute, then, you, then it's, it's a much better place and it's a much more agreeable place to be at. Uh, in my own church, I, I do, Laura, make a point of checking visitors, especially at the time of the, of the coffee hour. And I've been impressed that visitors never just stand around alone. There's always someone, usually multiple people, to come up and introduce themselves. And that's something that really builds community. And if you can do that, you've got a lot of people who want to be a part of you. I'm the unofficial greeter at our church, and I pass out the bulletins and stuff as they come in. And I doesn't matter who they are, they they gather welcome and here's your bulletin. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's good. But I think maybe that's a muscle that as a congregation that could be strengthened as far as how, how, what's the best way to greet a visitor or something so you're not smothering or maybe that's something that can be kind of, I'm not a very good uh, meet and greet mingle person that kind of makes me nervous. So even maybe if you're helping people to know, okay, make sure that you're shaking a hand or kind of coaching people a little bit can be part of our training to know. I don't think that's a skill that has naturally come naturally to everyone in the congregation. So if that's even, even little pointers, and I say that as an example, someone said to me at one point that if you greet someone by saying hello, to some people that's offensive. To some people they wanna then hear, hi, how are you doing? So to me, that was news to me. I was like, oh, I thought I said, hi, I acknowledge, you know, it, meaning to someone that I knew, but then to even say more that I needed to go that, that I was being offensive. Well, that was news to me. Oh, I'm being offensive by only saying hi. Okay, well, let me make sure that I'm saying the whole thing where to someone that was offensive, to me, it was no big deal. But now that I know, I can say four extra words and <laughs> not be offensive, you know, or something like that. So even if you can have those kind of skills sharpened a bit, I think might be helpful for our congregation. Yeah, and, and as you get visitors in and they introduce themselves, you find out a little bit about them, and judge, you know, their age or their where they're coming from and everything. It's easy enough to, to uh, uh, go to uh, someone else uh, and say, you know, hey, Laura, this this woman has a son who lives in upstate New York. Uh, uh, maybe you ought to talk to her uh, and uh, get them hooked up with somebody who may have something in common with them. We well, did I have a minister who... Uh, read somewhere about the issue or cases, I guess, where a uh, congregation or church was overly uh, welcoming, like they, they pounced on the, the visitor like they were fresh meat uh, and, and that, that issue. And he went to the other extreme then. And uh, I think we had had a, a practice this of uh, uh, asking uh, if they're at, at the beginning of service, does anyone want to introduce themselves? And maybe you see someone, if you saw someone, minister saw someone who was a little different, he said, would point at them and said, would you like to introduce yourself? And this minister stopped that practice because of what he had read in that article. Uh, and we never resumed it. Although well, we used to have the gathering or the come to yeah. But at the end of the service, everyone would go up toward it or be around the communion table. Mm -hmm. And then it was a good time to introduce visitors because they felt they're part of the same group. Yeah. They don't have the gathering anymore? No. Um, no. No. I had think Larry Fanny needed getting rid of it. And there are a number of of members of the church who felt uncomfortable with it. True. 
I can see Charlene made a comment that we are looking for more greeters. So <clears throat> that's yeah. something that people are actively doing, it looks like. So that's good. Everyone's a greeter, even if they're not a greeter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. About 15 years ago or so, we had a member who, a uh, young person, who noticed this issue and set up a video camera uh, at, at, in the narthex or somewhere, I guess, and then showed it oh, yeah. to several members of the church. So it showed people walking into the church, visitors, strangers, walking past members of the church who ignored them. Um, mm. And we made an effort for about six months, I think, and then reverted to form. However, yes, and while that while is a we, subject that is oh, really okay. Can everybody hear oh. me? Okay. I was gonna say, yeah, it we 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 do try to teach that it's everybody's job to be a greeter, but we also recognize that we need someone to intentionally do that, and that over the summer we had a lot of visitors, and so those visitors were coming and not really being intentionally greeted. And so what we're doing now is trying to find a greeter for each Sunday of the month, someone that's standing in the back of the church, intentional about making sure those people are greeted. So I do think we wanna encourage the whole church, but in addition, we're looking for some people to take one Sunday of the month to be a greeter. Mm -hmm. That sounds good, do a combo. Well, I, I had a, an experience with a UCC church about four or five years ago uh, where I went there. Again, it was a matter they were considering the open and affirming process, and they wanted to know what we had done. So son Frank and I went out there. Uh, Frank Allen was uh, chair of the church council at the time this uh, open and affirming discussion took place. And... Uh, we walked in the side door and uh, a couple of people were staying. They gave us a bulletin, but they yeah. seemed surprised that we were there. Yeah. And we walked in, yeah. sat down, and uh, uh, nobody came sure. over to say hello. Uh, they had the time of the passing of the peace. And I turned around. That's good. That's good. A person was, was uh, there. Uh, Peace to you, he said. I, I shook his head. I said, I'm Frank, as he was turning away from me. Hi. And uh, after, after it was uh, after the service, uh, we sort of wandered downstairs, but nobody came and say hi or anything until we got there. So I made a point of mentioning that. And the person, I think the pastor was one of the people in the, sub, in the discussion afterwards. And when they said that, he said, oh, our regular greeter didn't show up. <laughs> our regular <laughs> greeter. Oh. So uh, that's why I say everyone is a greeter. <laughs> or should be. On, on Peter's note, as far as like how, how many times people need to be reminded, your email was very helpful personally to me. I saw it on the newsletter, but then when I got your email, I was like, oh, that's right, that's coming up. So that is very, I also got a reminder from my mother as well. So that's also really helpful is to get those reminders and not just put it in the newsletter. So even as you were saying that, I'm jotting it down like, okay, I do remember the ukulele concert because that's the ukulele. I, I got to see the ukulele. But to, to kind of remind people, I think is a really good thing. Yeah. I mean, you shouldn't have to, of course, we should put it on our calendar, but let's be real. You got to remind people a billion times about stuff coming up. Mm -hmm. And on that note, our next thing you said is the pastor is going to be speaking to us from your church, Mr. Schneider, or? Yeah, uh, I, think, I think she has, uh, I don't know what the date is, but uh, uh, Wei Jen, contacted her uh, and uh, she's much more militant than I uh, and uh, she has she is a Methodist pastor a lesbian Methodist pastor uh, and that's not permitted in the Methodist church except she is and Emery Purcell was the person who played a large part uh, in, in getting her ordained good good uh, so she is uh, 
She is a full-fledged pastor. I won't steal any more of her thunder. But uh, <laughs> and, and by the way, Tracy. November 17. Oh, November 17. Okay. Oops. What day of, that's a, a Wednesday, is it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Well, it's it's really been great to see all of you. I just uh, I, I am so happy that I had this chance. I, this this is my old community. Most of you. <laughs> is it out of line to say how your family? <laughs> Well, I'm going to sign off now since I yeah. I listened to what Frank had to say and I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, yeah, it was it was very useful. Just just uh -huh. uh, one last thing to say. Uh, if you have any thoughts or questions or want to talk to me about this at any other time, it goes without saying. But I'm going to say, feel free to call me. I'd love to talk to me. <laughs> Will do. Will do. Sure. Take care. Bye. You too. Bye. 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 All of you. Bye. 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 Good night. Yeah. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Frank. Bye. Thank you, Peter and Judy, for hosting the meeting tonight. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Thank yeah. you, Injun. Yeah, I'm glad. Well.